and uh, debate on the topic uh, uh, Islamism versus Europe, which will win? Hopefully, it will be Europe to win, but it is important to uh, have a, a bigger awareness of this ongoing conflict, awareness that uh, there is a conflict that it is our duty to, to fight it, to preserve our civilization, our society, our, and our culture uh, against this uh, uh, very, very dangerous enemy that is uh, today also inside our uh, nation and our continent. Working language is English, in homage to our very distinguished uh, guest from the United States, Professor Daniel Pipes. He is a guest of uh, high uh, international uh, standing, a well-known scholar of Islamic studies. He is also the president of an important think tank, the Middle East Forum. And uh, our second and uh, equally appreciated speaker is Mrs. Laura Cianciarelli. Laura is an Arabist, a Middle East analyst for various uh, Italian media. She is also author of uh, uh, this uh, recent uh, Machiavelli report uh, in uh, title in Italian language, ISIS 2.0, the end of the caliphate uh, means no, doesn't mean uh, the end of the jihadist threat. You can find it in our copies here or just uh, Free, download for free on our website. Um, could you explain, Laura, why is uh, Islamic terrorism still a present uh, and uh, serious threat to Italy and uh, in general to the Western civilization? Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here tonight. Is it working? Okay. Um, it's a real honor for me to be a part of this panel. A special thanks to Professor Pipes and of course to Centro Machiavelli for um, hosting this debate. As you probably know, Europe is currently facing a big threat of Islamic extremism from ISIS, despite uh, its apparent collapse in Syria and Iraq. It has become increasingly clear in the recent months that the ideology driving the ISIS caliphate is thriving even though it has lost almost all its ground in the Middle East. The important thing is we must understand that ISIS identifies itself with the jihadi Salafism. And jihadi Salafism is an ideology that believes in a strict interpretation of Islamic dogma and acts as an umbrella for a variety of terror groups around the world, such as Al-Qaeda. Without the need of a central organization, these terror groups pose a big threat and can act independently, which makes it hard to counteract them. It follows that by physically defeating one single group, there is no guarantee that another will, be, will not be replaced by another. And ISIS can be a good example in that it has managed to evolve into an underground network um, safe from outside threats. But now, let us look concretely at the way ISIS may pose a threat to the world, to Europe, and to Italy in particular. In the territories of the ex-caliphate, ISIS um, is getting organized and uh, um, is sowing the seeds of discontent by destabilizing security and stability and uh, fueling internal sectarianism. ISIS has been attacking infrastructure and civilians in a very cold-blooded manner. A few weeks ago, several terrorist attacks occurred in Iraq during the recent Eid al-Fitr celebrations raising concerns of the resurgence of the Islamic State. Moreover, ISIS is trying to get organized and to create new provinces. They call these provinces Wilayat. Uh, the purpose of that 
is to um, gain a kind of control and regroup. And for example, recently in India, ISIS has established a new province by taking advantage of the local tensions between the Indian government and the Kashmir local fighters. In Europe, however, uh, ISIS may pose a different series of threats. First of all, around 4,000 European nationals reportedly joined the ranks of ISIS between 2011 and 2016. 22 to 24 percent has already made their way back to their home countries. And these may pose a real threat to the national security due to their radicalized indoctrination, radical indoctrination and their military training. Uh, it is also believed that many will not only be able to spread ISIS ideology, but also capable of carrying out terrorist attacks. And uh, another thorny and important issue is of the return of women and children. Children have spent almost their entire lives within the Islamic State, and many women in the last phase of the caliphate have played active roles, being asked to take up arms. So they may pose a threat to Europe national security because they will likely be repatriated first. But considering their particular, particular situation, considering that we are talking of women and children, uh, it's paramount to judge them individually. Secondly, uh, in two years, many radicalized inmates who are serving terrorism charges will be released from prisons across Europe. And they may pose a high risk of recidivism, which means they may fall back into the hands of the terror groups, which takes me to perhaps the most important threat to Europe, which is posed by sleeping cells. Many, many ISIS followers are already living in Europe. They are pa um, patiently waiting and ready to carry out attacks against, against the targets, on targets. To have a clear uh, idea of the threat that ISIS posed to Europe, we should talk also of uh, homegrown terrorists. Similarly to sleeping cells, homegrown terrorists who radicalize through online ISIS propaganda um, are at the disposal of ISIS, of the terror group. So um, according to Interpol, in most attacks in Europe in 2017 were carried out by homegrown terrorists. We are talking of European nationals. These individuals are Europeans, uh, which means they were born or have spent almost their entire lives in Europe. So uh, a few words on, finally, a few words on the Italian situation. Uh, despite not being attacked, Italy uh, is facing or may face the same threats of other European countries. So, um, so far, the number of Italian foreign fighters uh, involved is 138. Even though this number, the number of Italian foreign fighters is not so high, is low in comparison to other European countries, they still pose a threat to our national security. So in conclusion, uh, we can say that by identifying themselves with the ideology of uh, jihadi Salafism, these terror groups may pose a cyclical threat to the world, to Europe and of course to Italy. And therefore, uh, it's mandatory, it's the paramount to understand that the single terror groups pose a threat and we have to defeat them, but the real threat is their underlying 
ideology, which, which is the jihadi Salafism. So we must understand that and fight that to end the jihadi threat once and for all. Thank you. One of, of uh, the first person to denounce the threat posed by Islamism already in the early 90s was uh, uh, precisely Daniel Pipes. He has been described as a leading uh, neoconservative thinker, uh, especially influential during the administration of George W. Bush, who in fact appointed him uh, uh, as a board member of the United States Institute for Peace an appointment that also caused some clash with Democrats in the Senate because they, they, they thought that he is not uh, enough politically correct on Islam for them. Um, Professor Pipes is currently focusing on the European situation, the European political landscape, uh, where he described a civilizationist uh, reaction to mass migration, to multiculturalism, and also to the growing phenomenon of political Islam. Uh, could you tell us, Professor Pipes, what, uh, what is that civilizationism reaction, what it means for the future of our uh, continent? Well, thank you. Thank you, and thank you everyone for using English. I understand that I'm the only English, native English speaker here, so thank you very much. Um, I've given many talks. I've never given a talk for Institute with a name as great as yours, Machiavelli Center, what, you know, perfect. <laughs> um, yes, the um, Italian media thought I was very important to George W. Bush, and the term that was all the time used was consigliere di Bush. Uh, I was not consigliere de Bush, but it gave me a prominence in Italian media. Just two hours ago, I had a call from Mastampa to ask me about what happened in uh, the Persian Gulf because I'm still seen as consigliere de Bush <laughs> all these years later. Uh, I very much agree with uh, your statement, Laura, that the real threat is the ideology. Yes. And that, it's been a very difficult process to convince Westerners that the real threat is the ideology. And there's good reason why that is difficult, because basically the West is Marxist, the West is materialist. Basically most Westerners, both left and right, believe that the only real source of action is money. The economics is the dominant factor. And to argue that ideas, religious ideas, are the compelling force is to go against the great assumption of materialism. So naturally, it's been difficult to get Westerners to accept the importance of ideas. But ideas are really what make us who we are. You are not what you eat what you had for breakfast or lunch today is really not very important. You are what you think. That's why we're here. Not because of what we ate, but because of what we think. And that is the key to understanding the threat. <clears throat> uh, you asked me a question, but I'm not gonna focus on the civilizationalist parties. Be happy to talk about that later. But I've come up with this term civilizationalist. What the press, and the opponents of these parties, who generally call them far right, neo-fascist, populist, nationalist, I don't think any of those quite get the essence, uh, whether it be the Lega or Fidesz in Hungary or Rassemblement National in France or the Swedish Democrats or Vox or the, Volks, the Volkspartei in, um, in Austria, I think the key is that these parties uh, seek to preserve Western civilization. That means the nation, it means Christianity, it means customs, it means keeping what one has. 
And I think that is the essence. But that's not my initial topic today. What I'd like to do is um, reflect on the difference between Islam in Europe, broadly speaking, and Islam in North America, especially the United States, but also Canada. They're very different. And I think there's a lesson for Europeans in this difference. And so I hope that bringing the American experience is useful to you in understanding the situation here. Now, there are many differences, broadly speaking, between American and European Islam. For one, in the United States, there is no major nationality. There is no major nationality, such as the Algerians in France, or the Turks in Germany, or the South Asians in Britain, uh, people coming from all over. Secondly, the United States is, by its very nature, a country that brings in immigrants. To a certain extent, France is like that. But basically, Europe is made up of countries that are big families. Italy is a big family. Yes, they're provincial differences, but ultimately, you have the same history, you have the same language, you have the same foods. Uh, it's difficult to bring people in to a family. How do Somalis become Italians? Very difficult. Whereas in the United States, there is no family. It's an idea, the pursuit of happiness. It is relatively easy to bring in Vietnamese or Senegalese or uh, Latvians into the United States. There is no national family. Thirdly, the United States is different. Uh, American Islam is different in that about one quarter of our Muslim population is made up of converts, mostly black American converts. A very interesting and odd phenomenon called the Nation of Islam that goes back 100 years. Very different from mainstream Islam. Uh, has its own history. Nothing like that exists in Europe. Uh, also, in the United States, the percentage of Muslims is smaller. It's about 1% smaller than what one finds in most of Europe. But the most important difference, and the one that I will focus on, is socioeconomic standing. In general, the socioeconomic standing of Muslims is low. There are exceptions, there are elites, with a lot of money, a lot of education, but the majority of the Muslim populations in Europe have a low socioeconomic standing. This goes back to the Gastarbeiter Agreement between Germany and Turkey in 1961. It goes back to the Harkis, the Muslims Algerian, the Muslim Algerians who helped the French in 1962. It goes back to the Pakistani laborers who went to the Midlands of England in the middle 60s. Um, the Afghans, the Syrians, the Africans who come to Europe who generally do not have skills are not easily able to integrate. In the United States, it's very different. Our key event was in 1965. Notice all this 1960s, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, when a bill was passed, a piece of legislation was passed that opened the United States to immigration outside of Europe. From 1924 to 1965, it essentially was just Europe. Not You could have 100 Chinese, 100 Indians, very, very few. 1965, opened that up, and now for the first time in the 20th century, it was possible for people to come from all over. And this legislation stressed education and family ties. So the most desirable Immigrants are those who are educated. As a result, a great number of Muslim immigrants to the United States are doctors, engineers, and so forth. If you go to a doctor's office and look at the names, you will find a substantial number of Muslim names there. That is not the case in Europe. 
Um, and uh, sociologists have estimated that the Muslim population of the United States has a higher socioeconomic average than the whole population, very different from Europe. This, I think, has profound implications. Now, I'm going to speak about the right, not the left, how the right sees things. In Europe, the right tends to focus on mundane problems, on the problems of every day. Um, I was very impressed a couple of months ago when I went to visit a, a city councillor in Vienna who gave a report to me about the problems concerning Muslims in the city of Vienna. And it's a long list. It had to do with unemployment, with overuse of medical facilities, exploiting the opportunities to have free medical care, language difficulties and language lessons, training and skills to be capable to get work in the Austrian market, the problems of living apart and the alienation that comes from that, diseases that have come to Austria, diseases that Austria did not know for many decades have come back, criminality. Uh, the jails are disproportionately full of immigrants and particularly Muslim immigrants and various crimes that are distinct to Muslims. Honor killings, the hadrush, the uh, sexual predation, such as happened in Cologne, and so forth. All these are problems for a city government. One finds similar kinds of problems in other parts of Europe. For example, here with the ports, and the refugee centers, such as the one in, in Sicily, uh, Mine Mineo, um, a very specific set of problems. Or in Lesbos, in Greece, similar kind of problem. In the United Kingdom, uh, one finds rape gangs, rape gangs that go on for 10, 15 years, and the police don't deal with it. In France, one has no-go zones, places where the authorities do not dare to enter unless they go en masse, together as a convoy, 10 cars, 12, 15, so they have enough guns and enough uh, force that they can enter into the areas. These are all problems that do not much exist in the United States. Yes, there are some exceptions. For example, the Somalis in Minnesota uh, were brought in and put in Minnesota, they have generally lack skills, uh, have a lower educational level, have difficulties. And of course, a number of the American black converts do not have skills. So there are exceptions. But basically, the list that I just read you about criminality and lack of skills and so forth does not apply to the Muslim population of the United States. And Therefore, Europeans tend to look at the United States as a place that has solved the problem. We don't have the problems you have here. But I am now going to report to you that we have our own problems. They're different problems. But in some ways, they're worse problems. So even when you have solved your everyday problems, you then have a new problem to, to face. And that is Islamism. Islamism is a form of Islam that attempts to regain the glories of a thousand years ago by trying to live as Muslims did a thousand years ago. ISIS is the most perfect example of that, doing everything it can to live like Muhammad lived, but not every group is so extreme. All the Islamists seek to apply Islamic law, the Sharia. All of them believe that applying Islamic law will make Muslims strong and rich as they were in the medieval period. All of them seek the recreation of the caliphate, al-Khalafa, 
to be the ruler over a single Muslim polity. Now, um, it's not that Islamism is not present. Of course, ISIS is here and so forth. But the focus of European attention tends to be on criminality, unemployment, skills, disease, sexual predation, and so forth. We pay much less attention to those everyday issues, and we, again, speaking about the right, not the left, we are focused on Islamism. Because American Muslims are well integrated into mainstream life, they can look beyond the immediate concerns and they can think big. And it's not just violence. And indeed, violence clearly is not the way forward. If you wish to change the system in a Western country, clearly violence is not going to get you there. We all have police. We have intelligence services. We have militaries that can take care of the violence. If you have great aspirations to take over, it has to be by having people come in, by having dawah, by having proselytization, by propaganda. Uh, you have to get your ideas across. And that is, in fact, what we experience more than you do. Let me give you a few statements by prominent American mainstream Muslims. Siraj Wahaj was the first Muslim ever to give a prayer before uh, Congress had a meeting. This was some 25 years ago. So he's prestigious, he's mainstream, and yet he said that Muslims can replace the US constitutional government with a caliphate. Quote, if we were united and strong, we'd elect our own emir, our own leader, and give allegiance to him. Take my word, if six to eight million Muslims unite in America, the country will come to us. It's not actually six to eight, it's more like three, four, but that's not important. What's important is that he believes that if Muslims act together, uh, they can take over the country. Ismail al faruqi was a professor of religious studies at Temple University. I went by the Temple University building today, so you, you have Temple here. Uh, Temple University in Philadelphia. He was the first theorist of how to make the United States a Muslim country. Quote, nothing could be greater than this youthful, vigorous, and rich continent of North America turning away from its past evil and marching forward under the, under the banner of Allahu Akbar, under the banner of God is great. Zayed Shakir was the Muslim chaplain at Yale University. He has stated that Muslims cannot accept the legitimacy of the American secular system, which, according to him, quote, is against the orders and ordainments of Allah, against Allah, to the contrary, he said, the orientation of the Quran pushes us in exactly the opposite direction. In other words, Muslims may not participate in American life. Um, and, well, there are many more, but I'll stop there with the quotes. These quotes reflect a larger vision of taking over the United States. And not taking over through violence, but taking over through population ch change, through conversion, and through influence. So the actions of the Islamists in the United States tend to focus on school textbooks in the public schools to offer Islam and indeed, if you look at the public school textbooks, Christianity and Judaism are on the side, and Islam is given a special place, very often. University courses, what's called deplatforming. This is a new verb in English. Um, if you are talking about Islam on Facebook, 
etc. And it's not acceptable to Facebook, off you go. But it's not just social media. Uh, you can lose access to uh, MasterCard. You can be thrown out of hotel rooms, not, not a personal hotel room, but a meeting room. Uh, you can lose your bank account. Uh, you can have a lot of trouble if you say things which the Islamists consider unacceptable. Just uh, this last couple of days, one of our fellows at the Middle East Forum was supposed to give a major talk at an army school. Uh, the Islamists learned about it. They wrote a letter. They got upset. He's gone. No more talk. This happens all the time. Uh, they are bringing the Sharia, Islamic law, into the courtroom. There are a number of cases, increasing number of cases, where judges will look at Muslim uh, plaintiffs or, or, or defendants, will look at Muslims in a different way from non-Muslims, and will bring in the Quran, the Sharia, and apply it to Muslims. Uh, one sees it in donations to candidates, political candidates, money, influenced by giving money to candidates. You have to have money to do that. You have to be a doctor, an engineer, or something like that to have the capability to give money. And what's happened recently, it's not just money, but actual Islamist candidates. There are two famous ones now in the U.S. House of Representatives, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, they are the most famous, but there are plenty of others who are now in the American political system and who are quite openly advocating for Islamist power. So, in conclusion, yes, the mundane problems of criminality and unemployment are very important, but I urge you also to pay attention to the grand Islamist goal of changing society. In American terms, it's replacing the Constitution with the Quran. This may sound impossible, but look at the United Kingdom. It's happening in some places. Islamists want to take over. They believe Islam is a superior civilization, and they believe that Islam should have a special place, and they are pursuing it, particularly in the United States and Canada, quite openly. You can only prevent this if you understand it. It's not enough to focus on criminality and unemployment and drug trafficking and so forth. One also has to look at the larger picture. And so I the title of this talk is Islamism versus Europe, who will win? I don't know. <laughs> it's an open question. This is our burden. Thank you. We have some minutes for uh, debating. If there's any comments or questions. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have a very simple question, more as student and a citizen in um, a foreign country. Uh, you say that in Europe we are not considering as much as we should um, Islamic culture and so. So what do you suggest? Will it be necessary to build a new ideology? Because the main point could be why are European citizens, European nationals sticking on a foreign culture maybe which has nothing to do with their own roots. Um, which, is the, which is the point? Uh, I think that the civil, what I call civilizationalist response is the correct one. It's not to exclude immigrants. It's not to be, uh, to hate Islam. But it is to say to Muslim and other immigrants, you are welcome, but 
you must follow the rules. You have the same rights and the same responsibilities as everyone else. Things change. We are here in the parliament. Parliaments exist because things change over time. It's not static. You need new rules because things change. That's fine. But fundamentally, immigrants need to accept the order, the constitutional order that already exists. Within that order, it's fine to make changes. Which changes are fine and which are not fine, that's a subject for debate. But yes, changes in principle, but no, it won't work if, as the Islamists, you do not accept the existing order. Islamists do not accept the existing order. They want to change the order. That, I would say, is unacceptable. Thank you, Daniele. Grazie. Um, I have a, one question for Professor Pipes, whom I acknowledge excellent presentation, and a, a couple of questions very quick to Laura. Um, I apologize in advance if the questions will be centered on the issue of immigration, regardless if it is purely Islamic or not. So, to Professor Pipes, well, sorry, uh, mm, towards uh, self-presentation, I've been devoting my life to development cooperation. I've been country manager in four continents for Italian cooperation, Italian government, uh, European Union, and United Nations. And now my main interest is immigration exactly as the factor that most counteracts the philosophy of our life, that is development cooperation. Mass illegal migration is reverting the principle of sharing resources for a better world, that is the principle of development cooperation, and mass migration is destroying the beauty of this planet in terms of human biodiversity. So that's why the, the, the purpose of the rest of my life will be this. <laughs> Sorry. Now, uh, to Professor Pipes. You presented us the uh, American or USA pattern of migration versus the European one. That's a very interesting reflection. My question is, this model of low educated immigrants sometimes entered through illegal channels, in any case of low quality, especially aggressive, reluctant to integrate, and so on and so forth, all the things that you told us, that uh, are evidenced in, in the Euro, especially in the last waves of immigration in Europe, and so different from America. Isn't it that the United States is facing the same pattern with the last waves of immigrants from the southern border, like Central America and so on. Are you copying, let's say, the European model? By the way, also European model is it, it, uh, not, com not complete, I would say, because the United Kingdom had the same Euro model. Hospital in London are full of doctors and nurses, very well qualified, very well educated. So it resembles more the American than. So this is the question to you. You prefer that? The question to Laura later, or now. So very quick to Laura. Um, the war in, in, in Syria and Iraq from 2011 provoked a big wave of refugees. In my perception, it did not affect Italy at all. I've never met. I'm around, I'm in this world, I never met one, Syri one single Syrian on one single Iraqi, unless of a different category than migrants. Uh, why? How could you explain this aspect? And the second question related to this, why Italy has not been affected so heavily by terrorism as other neighbor European countries? That's it, thank you. So uh, the first question, uh, it didn't affect Syrians and Iraqis? Oh, uh, okay. We had, after the war in Syria and Iraq, yeah. we had a 
tremendous wave of immigrants from Nigeria and Gambia and Ghana. Okay. So, um, it was temporarily related, but not. So <laughs> the Syrians yep. are in Lebanon. Uh, Syrians are of course, in Jordan. In the Balkanic route. Yes, yeah. they didn't reach Italy, not even through the, the, our northeastern border. But they don't, I don't think don't choose to Italy. I think Inside. people just ran away from uh, the war and ran into neighboring countries, and it was easier for them to reach Lebanon and uh, Jordan instead of Italy, which is far from Syria in a certain way. I'm talking about the European quota. The European, uh, the quota? European quota okay. of migrants from the war area. Okay. That reached Germany, indeed. Yes. Because of open, open borders. Open doors Maybe. You, you mean people who are coming into Europe from, uh, I don't know, Syrians, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it's the, just that uh, when a war spread out, then people try to reach the, con the safer country near, the nearest and safer country maybe. So from Africa, it's easier to come to Italy. Uh, it's not so easy from Syria maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's not far. Uh, there are ways. Balkan route is full of people from Asia. Bangladesh, Afghani, yes. Pakistani. So yes. It's this stream. Uh, yeah, there are different types of migrants, uh, t uh, different causes that uh, cause migration. Uh, there are many factors, I think, that contribute to, to that. But That's another case because they don't want to stay here and they try to reach uh, North Europe or other countries. Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah, there is a Syrian community in Italy. There is in Rome, there is, but maybe it's not so, there, there aren't so many people or maybe mm, we don't have so many news about them. So it's not there is a Syrian or Iraqi community in Italy, but maybe they reach other, they prefer to reach other countries or the numbers are not so high in comparison to uh, the migration uh, uh, rates from other countries, African countries. There are a lot of reasons, I think. And the second question was about, yeah, I think that, okay. You know, uh, <laughs> I think we don't know all of that because uh, secret services are working on that. So most part of these information are not, are not open. But maybe I think we are very strong in uh, preserving our country from terrorist attacks. The way, the ways, I don't know. But we are strong in it. And I think uh, what Italy should do is probably uh, work on um, uh, limit or to prevent uh, Islamization or to, to um, create programs to de-radicalize people, uh, for example, Italian foreign fighters. This is what we have to work on, I think. If I might also address those two points. Um, when Angela Merkel said, welcome Syrians, suddenly a lot of people became Syrian. Uh, when the Swedish government said, if you're Syrian, you may enter Sweden and become a permanent resident, more people became Syrian. Right. So there are a lot of fake Syrians who are not real Syrians, and that why, that's one reason why you haven't met them. A lot of Syrians are not Syrians. On the second point, I had a discussion a couple of days ago with a criminologist and he said, there has been no terrorism in Italy for 25 years. This is not my topic. But I remembered that a few months ago, uh, Hossein, Hossein 
Hussein Asi, a Senegalese, took a bus that he was driving with 51 children, and who knows what could have happened. Fortunately, it didn't. I recall that in 2004, Mustafa Shauki uh, had a bomb outside of McDonald's in Brescia. I recall in 2003 in Modena, I forget the name, but a Palestinian had a bomb outside a synagogue. Again, this isn't my subject, so I don't know how many more cases there are, but clearly there has been uh, terrorism, jihad in my terms, in Italy. What I find internationally is that the police, the prosecutors, and the politicians don't want to call it jihad, don't want to call it terrorism. And again and again, you have these events that take place of Muslims attacking non-Muslims and the police saying, a crazy person, uh, or not explaining at all. One particular case that interest, interested me was in the United States, in New Jersey. A Muslim Egyptian murdered and decapitated two Egyptian Christians, buried them underground. He went to trial, he's in jail, but we never found out why he did this. Was it over money? Was it over a woman? Was it a family thing? Or was it jihad? We have no idea, and it took place six years ago. So they hide it, and they say it's, it's just murder. But clearly, in some cases, I mean, when a Palestinian has a bomb outside a synagogue, doesn't that make you think it might have some larger political motive? So I don't trust the police. I call them the police, you know, the prosecutors. They're not, they're not serious. And I, I was told in, in, in Italy it's different. They are serious. You can trust them, but uh, I don't believe that. On um, your question for me about uh, Latin Americans, yes, um, there is a similarity between, uh, say, Africa and Europe and Latin America and North America. Uh, for example, our largest source of immigrants now, surprisingly, are Guatemalans. Guatemala, Guatemalans, not Mexicans, Guatemalans. Uh, it may have to do with the price of coffee going down, and who knows, but 140,000 uh, Guatemalans last month tried to enter the United States. So yes, the, the size and the um, nature of the illegal immigration is similar. The big difference is that Guatemalans and Mexicans and other Latin Americans do not have jihad, do not have Islamism. There are some non-Latin non Americans who come through Texas and Florida and, and so forth, Arizona, but they're small in number. The overwhelming majority are Latin Americans who are not jihadis, who do not have Islamist uh, ideas. So yes, there are lots of mundane problems of criminality, of lack of skills, and so forth. But in that case, that's the problem. There's not, yeah, there is something called, uh, I think, La Raza, a Mexican group that believes that the southwestern part of the United States should go back to Mexico. I mean, it's not very serious. Is Texas going to go back to Mexico? I don't think so. But yes, they do have a kind of jihadi mentality, but I don't think they've ever engaged in violence, and I doubt that they ever will. It's not, it's not jihad. So yes, there are similarities, but they're Christian, not Muslim. Hello. Um, I have a curiosity about, uh, you've mentioned Nation of Islam, uh, Farrakhan, right? Who you have mentioned many times in your excellent book about the theory of conspiracy. So my curiosity is, would you call the Nation of Islam in the United States, a radical group, an Islamist group, or more on the moderate side of Islam? Thank you. Uh, Nation of Islam is a very interesting and special case. It began a century ago when some 
American blacks try to escape being African blacks by saying, no, well, we have dark skin, but Indians have dark skin too. We're not Africans, we're Moors, Moros. Um, and with that came the idea that we're Muslims, we're not Christians. And uh, in the 1930 or so came uh, the notion that the Nation of Islam, a separate organization, that to be Muslim is not to be black. And you can avoid the discrimination by becoming Muslim or, or Nation of Islam. Nation of Islam was created by American blacks who knew very little about Islam. And if you look at the specifics of Nation of Islam, it's not Islam. Uh, and for the first few decades, until the mid-1950s, Nation of Islam was a small group that nobody heard of and had no connection to Islam. In the 1950s, a couple of things happened. Malcolm X made it a major, much more important phenomenon. More people joined. And uh, for the first time, they came into contact with Middle Easterners, with Iraqis and others, who said, this isn't Islam. And so tensions developed, and many of the Nation of Islam members became regular Muslims, normative Muslims, Muslims as we understand it, including Malcolm X. He converted out of Nation of Islam to become a regular Muslim. This led to many tensions, including his murder, in 1975, the head of the Nation of Islam died. He had sent his two children to, uh, his two sons to Cairo, where they learned Arabic and they learned real Islam. And so when one of them succeeded his father in 1975, he made the whole thing regular Islam. But in 1978, Louis Farrakhan said, no, I can't accept this, I want the old nation of Islam. And now for 40 years, Farrakhan, who is quite sick with cancer, has headed nation of Islam. Nation of Islam is small. I mentioned that one quarter of American Muslims are converts, mostly black. The overwhelming majority of them are regular Muslims. Their origins come from nation of Islam, but they or their parents or their grandparents left Nation of Islam in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and they're just regular Muslims. The Nation of Islam, maybe 20,000 people. It is all about Farrakhan. I expect that when Farrakhan dies, which could be any day, uh, Nation of Islam more or less collapses. Nation of Islam, to answer your question, is radical, but it's not Islamist. It is anti-white. It is anti-American. Nation of Islam wants to separate the United States into white uh, America and black America. There's a famous picture of the head of the American Nazi movement, Nazi movement, sitting there listening to a speech by the former head of the Nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad. In other words, they agreed. The Nazis and the Nation of Islam agreed racial separation. It's a terrible thing to have uh, races together. Uh, Nation of Islam is not Islam. It's, it has become more Islamic over the past century. In, uh, Louis Farrakhan goes to Iran, goes to Libya, went to Libya, and he's been influenced, but still it's not Islam. So I think it's a temporary phenomenon. It was the bridge between unchurched blacks, blacks who are not really Christian, and Islam, it served its purpose. It's now no longer very significant, but it had a very ma major impact. And there are three quarters of a million American blacks who are Muslim. And the numbers could go much higher. So it has an important historical role, but and, and it had a violent, it was quite violent, 
but now it's, it's elderly, it's small, it's not very dangerous or important. Very quick. Before you were talking, uh, Daniel, a question for Professor Pipes. Before you were talking about the situation now in the United States about uh, Muslims who are American Muslims who have, are advocating a change in the American Constitution and wish to bring the United States to Islam. So these are people who are already in the United States. They have been teaching in universities. They are mainstream. They're quite famous. What is the antidote? for this kind of situation? And do you think there is a change right now uh, between the Obama administration attitude towards this kind of problem and what is the Bush, Amer uh, the, the, sorry, the Trump admi uh, administration doing? Uh, do you see there is a change in attitude toward this specific kind of problem or none? Thank you. Uh, thank you. The it feels like the Cold War again, in that left and right in the United States and in Europe have a fundamentally different approach. So in the Cold War, the right said the Soviet Union is a terrible threat. The left said, not so much. We can work with them. And so today the same. Uh, the right tends to see Islamism, or more broadly Islam, as a great threat. And the left says, no, we can work with them. So whether it's a Republican or Democratic administration means a very different approach. But it's the same thing in Europe. I mean, if the socialists are in power in Austria, it's very different from the conservatives and the civilizationists. Um, there are there is a, an exception to that in Denmark. Just a week ago, the election showed a social democratic party uh, focusing on this question. So this is, this is, I think, very important and very new. But until now, uh, the left has been um, casual, has been um, uh, not very worried about this. So maybe, maybe Denmark points to a change. Uh, as for the antidote, what to do, um, the, the important thing, as both of us said earlier, is ideas. Um, one can't just focus on violence. One has to look at the ideas. And there, Islamism is a, there are many different kinds of Islamism, but it, just like there are many different kinds of communism, but still, there's a basic idea I mean, the Chinese Communist Party and the Italian Communist Party were very different, but still, there's a basic idea. And ISIS and the Muslim and er Erdogan are very different, but there's a common uh, quality. Um, we need to fight those ideas. And the most effective way of fighting those ideas is to help those Muslims who are anti-Islamist. Because in the end, the only way to attract Muslims away from the Islamist ideas that are so powerful today is by offering them an alternative. And we who are not Muslims can't do that. It has to be Muslims who offer an alternative. And therefore, I think it's a great mistake by many on the right, and more in Europe than in the United States, to see Islam as the problem. No, radical Islam is the problem, and moderate or reform Islam is the solution. You, we must help financially and morally and by providing platforms to the anti-Islamist Muslims to get their word out. Uh, they are critical. We can fight the Islamists, we can arrest them, we can put them in jail, we can argue with them, but in the end, it is the Muslims themselves. It's a civil war between Muslims. And it is the Muslims who are anti-Islamist who have to provide a message that is compelling, attractive, uh, that is going to defeat the Islamist message. It's going, to take a t it's going to take time. But it took time for the Islamist message. The Islamist message began 90 years ago. 
And by the way, Italy had an important role, uh, particularly in, in Egypt. They were looking, Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, was looking at Mussolini and said, this is interesting. We should learn from Italy. Uh, and it took, uh, at the same time, one had uh, Khomeini in Iran, Maududi in India, and others who were looking at totalitarianism and saying, looks good. Get the state, give the state more power, uh, have the leader be the leader of the people, and so forth and so on. Fascism, you know, they use this term Islamofascism. I don't, but I can see, you know, there is a connection. Uh, so that's an idea that took a long time. Uh, Khomeini came to power in 1979. That was 50 years after uh, 1929, when the Muslim Brotherhood was founded. It took time. It'll take time to have an answer to Islamism, but let's help the Muslims who wish to fight this evil interpretation of Islam. I'm sorry, but we have to, to conclude now. So uh, many, many thanks to our speakers. I hope to see you all uh, next meeting so, um, promoted by our Machiavelli Center. Thank you.